Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Grace Simpkins, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, where I work, which is located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Now, this series is designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Now, during the month of March, the NOAA Heritage Program is helping us take you behind the scenes at six different NOAA facilities during our NOAA Open House series. We will travel, virtually of course, across the country to showcase some of the amazing places where our scientists, engineers, educators, technicians, and interns work. Now today, so fun, we're going to be visiting NOAA's Seafood Inspection Facility in Long Beach, California. Now, while we'll be talking about NOAA's role in seafood inspection, we wanna recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that our speakers today are coming to us from the lands of the Keech people, commonly referred to as the Tongva, we are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe in the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedaquina. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speakers. You are all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we wanna make sure that everyone can hear our speaker. However, the box where you told me where you're from is a great place to write questions. Please let us know if you're a class tuning in and who is asking the specific question that you've listed so that we can give them a shout out. We encourage you to ask questions as we go. I'll keep track for our speakers, and they're going to stop every now and then and answer a few. We might not get to all of your questions, but we'll try to answer as many of them as we can. Now, I know that you are probably ready to hear from our speakers, so I am going to be turning it over to our first speaker. So Whitney, there's Whitney. So over to you, Whitney. They're all yours. Great. Grace, thank you so much for inviting us to be here today. Uh, we always attend the NOAA Open House, so it's very exciting to be invited to join the virtual event as well. Today we'll be taking you through a very busy day in the life of a seafood inspector, and we'll describe some of the activities our inspectors are involved in on a daily basis. Uh, as Grace mentioned, my name is Whitney Moore, and I am the National Training Specialist for NOAA's Seafood Inspection Program. Uh, most of my days are spent uh, working with my colleagues to help them better understand seafood safety and sensory and development uh, and, you know, moving forward progress on our policies and procedures. Um, but I, you know, always was interested in, in biology as a kid. I didn't really know seafood inspection existed exactly until I started looking for jobs after college. Um, when I first went to college, I thought I maybe wanted to be an eye doctor. And after volunteering at an eye doctor's office, I realized I definitely did not want to be an eye doctor. So I shifted my focus into something that I really, really loved, which was conservation biology, and ended up uh, graduating with a bachelor's of science in biology and a minor in chemistry. And I started applying for jobs and was lucky enough to be selected by the NOAA Seafood Inspection Program and have been here for a little over 11 years. I really enjoy my job. So I have a question for all of you and you can utilize that chat box that Grace mentioned earlier. I wanna know who here likes seafood and what kinds of seafood you like? Okay, this is Grace from the chat box. So what Whitney wants you to write in that box is, do you like seafood? And also tell us what kind. So let's see, Alice and Paul love salmon. Lachlan likes everything. Rachel says salmon and tuna. Ooh, a lot of salmon. Brenna says salmon, Elijah says shrimp, Patty says pickled herring. Oh, uh, my grandmother loved pickled herring. Uh, Texas likes it all. A lot of salmons. We have Margaret says lobster and shrimp. Oh, Anthony blue crab. I could keep going out. Let's see, we have um, clams, lobster and scallops, mahi. I'm looking to see if there are any others that I should throw in there. It's halibut, sushi crab. They just, they all love it. So I'm gonna all right. Leave it at that. I love it. I love to hear it. We have some sophisticated palates out there. Uh, I definitely love fish sticks 
and have always loved fish sticks. But since, you know, since taking this job, I've been able to try all different kinds of seafood and I really love crab and octopus and uh, wahoo is another one that I've never had until I started this job that I really love. Uh, when I was younger, I thought that fish was harvested you know, in the bay near my house and then, you know, taken by truck to my local grocery store. Um, and that's not typically the case for most grocery stores in the United States. So let's talk about how, how seafood actually makes its way to your plate. So out in the open waters, uh, you might find fishermen and women on these harvest vessels. And these vessels might look something like the boats that you see on Deadliest Catch, a bigger boat, or they might be smaller boats like you might see on Wicked Tuna, or they might be even bigger than a boat you have seen on either of those shows. And they head out on the open water, hopefully trying to bring home large quantities of fish or uh, other fishery products to the processing facility. So typically what happens is these fish are harvested on a vessel and then they end up first at a processing facility where they will turn into, uh, they take the live fish or the whole fish and turn them into some other type of fish like maybe fish fillets, maybe smoked salmon, uh, maybe cooked crab or my favorite fish sticks. Uh, and that's where we come in actually. Sometimes our inspectors are on site at these processing facilities and we are there to evaluate the quality and the wholesomeness of those uh, fishery products. So that's a colleague of mine sniffing his sample there to make sure that it's of high enough quality and wholesome enough to be sent to the next you know, step in this seafood distribution network as we call it, which is the local grocery store or restaurant near your house. Uh, where you can buy this product and have it on your plate for dinner tonight. And that looks like a seafood healthy, seafood heavy dinner there. Uh, so our, our NOAA seafood inspection program maintains contracts with some of these seafood processors and distributors. And we provide services that support compliance with, first and foremost, the applicable food safety regulations. So it's important that the food that we consume is safe for us to consume. So that's our number one priority. We are also involved in uh, product quality evaluations and grading. And that's what allows some of these processors to utilize these insignia that you see up here, these, these logos. Um, stamps sometimes we call them so if a processor so wishes they can request the use of these insignia on their packages similar to how the usda uses their prime or choice indicators for their quality of the beef uh, and we will allow them the use of this given the correct you know parameters and they can put this on their package so if you are ever shopping in your grocery store and you see one of these insignia you know that that product has been inspected by someone in our program uh, we're also involved in f facility and systems compliance, so overall system compliance at these facilities that process fish and fishery products, as well as uh, export health and catch certification. So when pro processors want to export seafood to certain destinations outside of the United States, they request those certificates from our organization and we certify those products uh, to be delivered all over the world. We also are involved in training and consultative services, which is where I'm, I'm usually working. So where can you find us? Where are our seafood inspectors in the United States? And realistically, we are all over the place. Uh, we've got these stars up here that are popping up that indicate locations where you might find some of our offices. And as you might notice here, most of them are nearby you know, oceans. Uh, we've got Alaska, Hawaii, and then the, basically the east and west and uh, southern coasts there of the United States. And the reason is, is because that's where the fish is coming in, right? So if we're getting fish from these locations, we wanna be nearby where that fish is being processed and being received by those processing facilities. So that's the these are the typical locations for our inspectors. So I might be up here in Alaska inspecting some dungeon, uh, excuse me, some king crab, uh, while my colleague Brianna is down in Long Beach uh, inspecting some live American lobsters. All right, any questions about our program specifically? Stop here for a second. All right, this is Grace from the chat box and I told you we have an inquisitive bunch. So this question comes from Jennifer. How many steps are there? Um, I know you're going to get um, and do an inspection, but about how many steps are there involved? In an inspection? Yeah, so when you were showing the ship that was collecting the um, fish and then the processing plant and then it gets inspected, about how many steps does it have to go through at the inspection facility? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
at the inspection facility specifically, it's it's typically we inspect it in the in the frozen state, and then we thaw it out, inspect it in the thawed state, and then we cook it up and inspect it in the cooked state. But as far as getting something from the ocean to your plate, it may be three steps, it may be 40 steps for that to happen. It just depends on what's being processed and who's who's doing it. Great question. Great. Great. And Alice and Paul are wondering, does all the seafood arrive by boat or does some of it get flown in? Yeah, really great question as well. Uh, products can arrive by boat. They can arrive by plane. Uh, they can arrive by truck as well. If we're bringing them down uh, from Alaska, maybe in a frozen truck of some sort. Uh, but also products can be processed on board the vessels that harvest those fishery products as well. So we'll see an example of that in a little bit here. Oh, and Rachel's wondering, can they arrive by train? Sure, absolutely, yeah. As long as it's got some sort of capacity to hold it as well as maintain the, the integrity of the, you know, the quality of the product. So if they've got refrigerated or frozen storage on that train, absolutely. Great, and Reagan's wondering, how do you become a seafood inspector? And if any of these questions are coming up, Whitney, you can feel free to say, stay tuned. Okay, for sure, thanks. Uh, ooh, that's a, that's a heavy question there. I think mostly, um, you know, working in this industry now for over 11 years, if you've got experience in the industry, that's gonna give you a leg up. If you want to be a seafood inspector, you're really interested in, in um, you know, inspecting seafood and tasting different kinds of seafood, I would encourage you to uh, possibly go into food, um, food science at co in college uh, and work in, and or work in the industry. Great question, Reagan. Okay, we have a lot more, we have many more questions, but I'm gonna save them because I know you have some fun stuff to share with us. So I'm gonna turn it back to you, Whitney. Thank you. All right. So we're actually gonna focus most of our most of our discussion today on a specific inspection office. I know we said that we're all over the country, but we're gonna focus specifically on one location and that is our Long Beach office. So this Google Earth zoom in here is gonna show you exactly where our office is in Long Beach, California. And I'm gonna check in with my good friend, Brianna Hurley now to show us uh, an inspection of some and give us some information about some lobsters. Hi, Brianna. Hey, great, thank you, Whitney. Um, yep, all good stuff. Our program is actually pretty exciting um, and, and very different from, from the normal jobs out there. So again, my name is Brianna Hurley. I am the Assistant Region Chief for the Southwestern Region Inspection Office. Um, and here you see a picture of me on a fishing boat when I was a kid. And I couldn't tell you exactly where this was because I grew up a military brat. So I traveled all around the world. Um, and uh, one thing was never, never changed is that I always loved animals. I always loved bugs and insects and anything that moved or crawled. I um, just really loved uh, digging in and, and getting to know what, what was really going on with these animals. So as I'm sure you all have a favorite movie, one of my favorite movies when I was little was Free Willy. And so I knew that I just needed to live near the ocean and I loved everything that was had to do with the ocean. So I ended up um, going to school to study marine biology at Cal State Long Beach and got my degree in marine biology and ecology. And shortly after college, I found myself working for the NOAA Seafood Inspection Program. So I have been here for about 13 years. Um, so I'm happy to be here. And today I'm gonna talk to you about one of our common local inspections that we do here in Long Beach. So up on the screen, you'll see two types of lobsters. The first one is the American lobster. And the second one is the spiny lobster. The spiny lobster is uh, a lobster that we have locally here. So you'll you'll see in just a minute, I'm gonna take you into a processing facility um, where we process these, these different kinds of lobsters. As you see the first one, the American lobster, it's also known as the Maine lobster. It has those big pincher claws. Um, and the difference, the main difference between the American lobster and the spiny lobster is that the spiny lobster does not have those big pincher claws. So it, it, some people may like to eat the American lobster because that, that meat that's in the claws is very white and very tender. Whereas in the spiny lobster, it doesn't have that meat. However, the tail actually has more meat than the American lobster's tail would. So these lobsters are called crustacean shellfish. Um, crustacea comes from the Latin word meaning crusted forms. 
And they're known of this because their hard outer shell and on this, the carapace, which is the top part of it, it has these segmented legs here. So you can see they have 10 walking legs. Um, crustacean shellfish are considered an allergen. So some of you guys may have allergies to certain kinds of food. Well, this is considered one of the major eight. In the US, we have what's called the big eight. And that, those eight allergens make up 90% of the food allergy reactions that we have in the US. So other, other allergens are included milk, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, wheat, soy, fish, and crustacean shellfish. And what we do in the NOAA Seafood Inspection Program is we, insist, we assist with inspections for certification, uh, including the live lobsters. And during these inspections, we check to make sure that your seafood is safe and wholesome. A part of these safety checks is uh, making sure that they are labeled correctly and that they have an allergy declaration on them as they are considered an allergen. Now let's take a look into a live lobster processing facility. All right, here we've got a tank and this is where the lobsters are kept while they're waiting to be packaged. Once they're unloaded from the fishing vessels, the live lobsters are placed into this refrigerated seawater. This water is kept at a little bit lower temperature than their natural environment so that it slows down the metabolism and prevents the stress of the lobster. Here I am conducting an inspection. So I'm looking to make sure that these live these lobsters are alive and well before they're being weighed, packaged, and then they get labeled and shipped. Uh, we inspect for quality attributes, meaning dead or weak lobsters. Uh, if they were dead or dying on the transit, then they could spoil. Um, and after we do the inspection, they're put into their, their packaging and we'll check for that allergy declaration. So here we've got the spiny lobster, as I showed you before. You can see that they don't have those forward pinching claws, um, but they do have spines all along their tail. And so that's why they're called the spiny lobster. It's actually a defense mechanism for them. They also have two large antenna. Um, and they've got the two parts, the carapace where, where those legs are attached and then the tail. But due to the flexibility of that tail, the, the length of the carapace is what's measured to see the size of these lobsters. Now here we're showing you the, how the live lobsters are transported for um, a, a long export possibly. So when we export these live lobsters, they package them with this layer of hay that's called excelsior. Um, and then they're also packaged with ice ice packs usually, and in a, stone, a fire, styrofoam box. Now lobsters have five pairs of gills. So as long as those gills are kept cool and moist, then they can remove oxygen from seawater, but also from the air. So lobsters can actually survive days out of the water if they're kept cool and moist. This, this shipment is going to China, and this typically takes around 30 hours. So we do the inspection, do the packaging, then they do the transport on the airplane. And then once they get to the other side, whatever country they're going to, that takes place again. So they do an inspection and then they're put back into tanks so that they can be sold for seafood. And this is the last step of our inspection. So once we have done the inspection and everything is approved and has passed, we then issue a certificate to that country. So we have different countries, um, and so each certificate is specific to that, that country, or we have a general export health certificate. And at, at the bottom, we will sign it and we'll stamp it and uh, issue that along with those live lobsters. And off it goes. So that, that is how we conduct our live lobster inspections. Now let's take some time to answer some questions. Great. Well, this is Grace from the chat box, and we have quite a few questions for you. So let's see. Um, Michaela wonders, do you inspect every piece of seafood that's in the store? Ooh, that's a good question, Michaela. Um, we do not. We, we typically will deal with um, export and domestic uh, seafood. So um, we are a voluntary program. Um, so the customer actually has to ask us to conduct an inspection. So they will actually pay a fee to have our inspection done for the NOAA Seafood Inspection Program. Great, and um, Elizabeth is wondering, how do you keep the seafood fresh? So I know for those lobsters, they were live, but I think the question is, if you have seafood that you're um, inspecting and then you need to ship, how do you make sure that it stays fresh during that whole process? 
Yeah, I think um, it, it really depends on the type of seafood. So yes, the, the, the one that I was just doing was, was live. So obviously we wanna keep them live until their final destination. Um, important fact is to, to make sure you're checking that label, right? So if it's, if it's frozen, you wanna keep it frozen um, until you're gonna consume it. If it's a, a fresh seafood, you wanna adhere to that labeling recommendation and say, okay, you, you can keep it fresh and under refrigeration at this temperature for this amount of time. So just as I was explaining with the allergen declaration on that label, you wanna be sure to be checking those labels. Great, and then Texas is wondering, how long does it take for the fish to get from the ocean to your plate? So I know you mentioned those lobsters might be um, shipped overseas. Do you have an estimate of how long it would take from being caught to being served up? I think for, for the lobster specifically, um, you're just looking at a couple days, uh, you know, maybe a day before they get inside the live holding tanks um, and they can be kept in those live holding tanks for, for you know, weeks. Um, but they typically will go out within days as well. And then the shipment occurs. And, and I explained that's, that's a, typically around 30 hours for the live shipments. Um, again, each seafood is different and some seafood is actually processed on the fishing boat, which you're, you're soon gonna see um, that, that it's sometimes caught and actually processed right there on the fishing boat and then transported into a processing facility. So again, it just kind of depends on the type of seafood that, that you're looking at. And one last question from Theodore. How long do you work each day? As seafood inspectors, um, our, our days are typically eight hours for our seafood inspection program, but you can have night shifts. Sometimes the fishing vessels need to have um, two inspectors there or early mornings. We also conduct audits. And so those audits can be lengthier, just depending, but we have a typical work day because we, we go to the processing facilities, pull samples, do our inspection. We can bring it back to our lab, conduct our analysis, which you're gonna see soon um, from my colleague. Um, and then we issue the certificate. So we have a typical work day. Great, and, and I said that was the last one, but I would think um, a lot of our viewers are hearing you say the processing facility. Can you just really briefly explain what that saying processing facility, what that means? What is a processing facility? Yeah, so the, the processing facility that you just saw was um, live lobsters. So they had holding tanks where they would keep those live lobsters, but other processing facilities might actually cook those lobsters. So they would have cookers um, and, and different other kinds of equipment where they would process that, that seafood. So if we have, let's say whole fish that come in um, from a container, then they have different kind of machines that will um, head the fish or gut the fish or fillet the fish. So that way in the grocery store, when you see just fillets, it comes from that processing facility. There was a step before that. So over the fishing boat to the processing facility and then to your grocery store. Excellent, thank you for explaining that because I think a lot of people were, were wondering. So again, uh, so many questions because you're sharing great information, but I'm going to um, hold it there and I'm gonna turn it back to um, Back to you and Whitney. Thanks, thanks, ladies. Thanks, Brianna. Awesome uh, intro to to lobsters there. So I want to take everybody into uh, two more processing facilities so we can get an idea of what processing means here. And the first one is a scallop processor. So uh, if you didn't know that, uh, this scallops are actually bivalves, which means that they have two shells that move like this, and scallops can actually swim. Uh, this is a little gif here of scallop swimming, and they can do that because they have a very, very strong adductor muscle. And the adductor muscle is actually what we eat when we eat scallops. So it looks like this. That's the adductor muscle most of the time. Sometimes people eat more than that, but uh, most of the time we're eating the adductor muscle of the scallops. Uh, I do want to just mention briefly that some of these processing facilities that we're going to show you, they may not be part of the NOAA Seafood Inspection Program, but we just wanted to demonstrate some different processing facility operations. Uh, that can occur across the United States. So this process of taking a whole scallop down to the adductor muscle actually occurs on a boat. Uh, they harvest out at, you know, in the open ocean and they take those shells and this guy's real quick. And he's just flipping that adductor muscle right out of there into a bin and the rest of it goes back into the water. Uh, then they rinse those adductor muscles that we now call the scallops or the scallop meat here. 
and they ice them down right away. And they do that to preserve the freshness of those scallops there. Uh, as they're heading back to shore, they'll bin these up. So they're putting them in these bags here to deliver them, basically. Um, they're going to just bin them up by, you know, basically what they can lift and what the bags can hold. And they tie up the bags and uh, await their delivery at the at the dock. So most of the time, these folks are going out for a day trip. They harvest while they're coming in. They harvest and they process while they're coming in to shore, and then they deliver their their catch uh, at a process another processing facility most of the time. So these are getting put into a tote, as you can see here, and they will go into this processing facility that maybe is going to take these scallop adductor muscles and make a breaded scallop or maybe a seafood salad of some sort. Uh, so they're getting delivered there. Pretty cool that it happens all at sea. Uh, and there are other processes that also happen at sea as well. Um, lots in uh, the Alaska area, actually. The next processing facility that I wanna take you into is a blue crab processor. So this processor receives whole crab. And uh, by the end of the process, they, they produce a uh, container of delicious crab meat. So let's take a look at their operation. So they receive these crabs uh, live in these little totes. And as you can see, they can take a fair amount of abuse uh, because they have that same hard outer shell that the lobsters have that Brianna mentioned. They can sort of you know, be abused pretty aggressively there. So they get put into this big bin, they're still alive here, and they're wheeled right into a steam cooker. And it cooks them whole. Uh, and they come out, and this gentleman's about to open up this steamer here, the steam cooker here, to reveal the cooked crab that come out. So they pull out this big old bin of cooked crab, and, and the next step there is that they're gonna take all of these cooked crab and put them into buckets and deliver them to the picking area. So the area where they have folks lined up and waiting for crab to be delivered to pull it all apart and remove the edible meat from inside of that instead of that crab so that you don't have to do it at home. It saves you a lot of work. And these ladies and gentlemen here are, are great at their jobs. They are fast, fast, fast. They can do it much faster than, definitely than I can. So she's got a crab down to the meat in about, looks like 20 seconds or so. She's picking out all those edible portions for you and putting it into a bin so that you don't have to do it at home. So then they're delivered to the, the weighing station where they make sure that each container of crab contains uh, the amount that's stated on the label. So that's another element that we'd evaluate during inspection is making sure that, okay, this, this bin should have a pound of crab in it. Let's make sure of that. So we would evaluate that uh, to make sure that consumers are getting what they're paying for. So he's ensuring that each one of those bins contains at least a pound of crab here uh, using that scale. Then they get a lid on top of them. So that's it. That's the that's pretty much the whole process. That's it. They get a lid and they get iced and refrigerated and delivered to refer to uh, grocery stores and supermarkets just like this. And uh, people can buy this product and eat it right out of the bin, or they can make seafood seafood cocktail or crab cocktail out of it, or a crab dip or a crab melt or Gosh, I could think of a million recipes for that product there. So that's a ready to eat product that came from right in one facility, a live crab down to a ready to eat product in a bin. So I have a little mini quiz for all of you. And I wanna know if you all can spot the products that we just saw being processed in my local grocery store. So I went down the street the other day, took some photos of my grocery store, and I wanna see if you guys can spot the products that we just saw being processed. So if you can use the chat box and let me know where you, or if and where you spotted those uh, fishery products that we saw. All right, so this is Grace from the chat box. So Whitney's asking you, this is the grocery store. Do you see any of those uh, products that were just processed? Do you see them on the shelves here? And Courtney and Hannah say that there is crab down on the right. Um, Maria says, yeah, lobsters and crab legs. Let's see, Larice sees the lobster as well. Brina sees scallops. And Jeremy says crab legs. Oh, and Norma says that blue crab. Um, looks like there's a container of blue crab if you look in that refrigerator um, off to the left there. And scallops, so everybody's got it. They all, they all see them. They see the scallops, they see shrimp and crab and lobsters. Yep, great job. Awesome. 
Awesome job, you guys. Yep. The lobsters, I'll circle it for you here. The lobsters are right here. These are actually cooked lobsters, so they look a little bit different than what Brianna was showing us earlier. There are some cooked crab legs right here and right here. They're still in the shell, so you'd have to do that cracking at home uh, on your own if you bought that product. These scallops are right here. These are some uh, sea scallops there probably very delicious and the cooked crab in the in the container is right here yeah great job you guys so next time you're at your seafood counter you can check it out and see if you see anything um, from from our from our videos today from our processing facilities so I'll pause here for any questions that anyone might have about the processing facilities specifically okay so this is um, great this is grace from the chat box and Robert is just wondering, this is not necessarily about the processing specifically, okay. but is the USDA, um, how does the USDA and the NOAA inspection that you do compare? Are they very similar processes? So the USDA is involved in evaluating um, fresh fruits and vegetables, um, processed fruits and vegetables and chicken and beef. So they are, um, you know, they conduct inspections based on their quality elements associated with those products. Uh, but it, I think it would be considered similar. They are also a fee for service program. So they, you know, accept fees from the people that are receiving the service that they provide and uh, they're inspecting for quality and food safety as well. So I think it's very similar other than that we handle almost all of the seafood um, and they handle those products that I mentioned before. Great. And Katya was wondering, um, where do they fish for those sea scallops that you showed us? The, that video specifically was out of Massachusetts, I believe. And correct me if I'm wrong. I had a little uh, clip at the top or a little indicator at the top and I can't remember just now. Um, but mostly on the East Coast, we're going to find those scallops. Sea scallops and bay scallops are going to be from the East Coast of the United States. Thank you. And so here in Massachusetts, I will tell you that, yes, we definitely have both in yeah. there. Uh, I'm biased, but they're very yummy. Um, <laughs> okay, we have a really great question from Irene. What do you do with the seafood that doesn't pass inspection? Great question, Irene. Uh, so there are inspections um, where products are deemed unfit for commerce. So if we're looking at a product, and we're going to talk about this shortly here, and it is uh, decomposed at such a level that it's really, you know, considered yucky. Um, the FDA under under part of their regulations renders that uh, adulterated under their under the FD&C Act, which is the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. So that product would have to be uh, destroyed or somehow reworked potentially, depending upon what they could do to rework it. Um, so, but if it's something that it's just not up to quality, um, they can they have the possibility to rework it to meet labeling requirements or possibly rework it to meet a, a grade standard and resubmit it for a new inspection. Great. And we have a couple of questions about what you inspect. So I'm going to, I'm going to go through the list. So just a quick, do you inspect clams? Oh yeah. Do you inspect, um, so I'm sorry, that came from Jamie. And Amaya asked, do you inspect sharks? I have not inspected sharks. I don't know about that. That's a great question. I will uh, ask one of my colleagues to have that answer available for the end of the presentation if we can. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I never great. have. And then Jamie just asked, what kind of fish do you inspect? If you could just give us a couple of the different types of fish. Yeah, oftentimes uh, what we're inspecting is, um, it, it's kind of all over the board. We inspect live products like live oysters, clams and mussels, live crab, uh, live lobsters out of, out of the Long Beach office, uh, smoked salmon. Uh, sometimes I've inspected sushi, like made sushi trays. And that was a great inspection. I didn't mind being on that one. Uh, fish sticks, uh, whole fish, fish fillets pretty, pretty frequently, shrimp, uh, scallops, you know, all kinds of different things. It's pretty, it's pretty great uh, getting to look at different products. You know, just on a Wednesday, you're looking at, at sea scallops and on a Friday, you're looking at smoked salmon. It's a, for a good day every day. Great. And someone asked if you get to eat 
the product when you're inspecting. And so I don't want you to answer that, Whitney. Okay. But if you ask that question, I want you to watch coming up because I think you're going to see the answer to that question. Yes. All right. We have, a lot, we have a lot of other questions, but I'm going to hold on to them and I'm going to uh, let you move on. Thank you. Thanks. All right. I actually have a question for all of you. So you can use the chat box one more time here, or again, I suppose we'll have more opportunities to use the chat box. I wanna know what kinds of things that you all think that we should consider when we're evaluating the quality of seafood. Okay, so this is Grace from the chat box. So let me know, in answer to Whitney's question, what are things that you think Whitney or Brianna might look at when they're evaluating the quality of the seafood? So let's see. AJ says maybe how healthy they are. Maria says their smell, their taste, their size. Um, Theodora says taste and the fact, um, you know, if it's dangerous or poisonous. Irene says color, as does Norma. Kate says freshness, and Janet expands on that, like whether they smell fresh. Um, a lot of people, Jasper, saying how it looks and how it smells. Um, Hannah is reiterating. You want to make sure it's not poisonous. Uh, Brenna is saying like cleanliness of it, how clean it is. Let's see if, if there are any others. Um, I think that that is most of it. I think that captures okay. it. Those are pretty good. Those are pretty good. Most of those are uh, involving some sort of evaluation that we would call uh, organoleptic evaluation. So that is a you know fancy word that basically just means that we're evaluating using our senses. And when we're looking at seafood, we're gonna use four out of the five of our senses. The first two, uh, sight and touch, we're gonna use when we, you know, when we have the fish in front of us and we can see it and touch it. And then we're gonna use our sense of smell and our sense of taste, because we did have that question about do we get to taste it? Yes, absolutely, we're gonna use our sense of taste and when we train up our colleague, my colleagues, and when, when we have trained personnel, we can actually uh, taste whether or not a piece of fish is high quality. So it's pretty cool. So let's talk first about uh, the, that sight and touch senses here. So if I'm looking at a whole fish, uh, there are a number of elements that I'm gonna look at to evaluate quality. And I can do this by using my eyes and my hands here. So the first thing I want to look at is the flesh. Most of the time when we're looking at whole fish, they're going to come to us eviscerated, which means that the processor or someone uh, took the viscera out, which means they took the guts out of that fish. So I can open up that, that belly and look at the flesh, meaning looking at the, the protein that we would normally consume of the fish. And what I'm looking for when I'm looking at the flesh is just making sure that it's not jellied. Uh, so looking like jello kind of gross, uh, or milky, kind of looking like someone poured milk on it and kind of blended it in there, uh, or chalky. I want to make sure that we have something that's translucent translucent uh, to the site. So it's going to be different colors maybe, but I want to make sure that we don't have that jellied, milky, or chalky uh, flesh. Then I'm going to look, take a look at the eyes, and the eyes are a great indicator of quality. So if someone tries to sell you some fish, take a look at the eyes first, because eyes should be really, really see-through. So, you know, like our eyes, uh, our own eyes, they need to be, you know, have a clear coating on the on them, see all the way through it. If they're getting milky or have some other, you know, something that doesn't, doesn't look translucent, you've got a lower, possibly a lower quality piece of fish there or fish. The next item we want to look at is the gills, and gills are a great indicator of quality. If I open up this little gill flap here and the gills are bright red, I know I have a I have a good idea that I have a good a high quality piece of fish there. Gills should be bright red, um, and when they reduce when they decompose or start to decompose, they're going to turn from bright red down to a tan or a brown or sometimes green. Uh, so take a look at the gills, and it'll give you a good indicator of of the quality of that. Um, of that fish. The last thing we want to look at is the skin, and this is where we're going to use our sense of touch as well as our, as our sense of sight. I'm going to evaluate the texture of this meat by pressing into this fish slightly, and if it bounces back and doesn't show my thumbprint there for a long time, I know that I have a very firm uh, textured fish, which is higher quality than something. If I press into it and my fingerprint stays there for a while, we know that that's maybe a lower quality uh, piece of fish. We're also looking on the skin for signs of dehydration, which is just a loss of moisture uh, from the surfaces 
uh, during for, uh, frozen storage and potentially other things. But these are some main ways that you can evaluate a piece of fish right off and know if you've got super high quality or maybe something else going on. All right, next, the next step is to evaluate the raw odor. So we're gonna get up in there like my good friend here is, uh, is smelling those samples that she's got in front of her to evaluate the raw odor of the fish. So if I smell a sample and I'm getting picking up odors like cucumber or oceany, I know that that piece of fish is probably is definitely high quality. If I'm smelling some raw fish and I'm picking up sour milk or cheesy, and it's just a piece of fish and there's no cheese anywhere nearby, I know that I'm looking at an unacceptable quality fish. So this is our sense of smell. Uh, fun fact for all of you, and maybe you know this if you're from the Pacific Northwest, but really high quality raw salmon actually smells like watermelon, identical to watermelon. It is the weirdest thing ever. You can smell a piece of raw salmon. If it's super high quality, right away, you're going to pick up a watermelon smell. And actually now, every time I smell watermelon, I think of salmon, which is, you know, maybe too many years in the seafood industry at this point. But that's a fun fact you can use at parties, I guess. <laughs> um, next thing we wanna evaluate is the cooked sample. So we're gonna cook up that same sample or a portion of that sample and smell it again. And it's a lot of smelling, but it's definitely important here. We're gonna evaluate odor one more time. Then we also get to taste it. And most of the time that's a great experience there because you're gonna taste all these different kinds of fish and most of them are amazing. Um, so that's, that's the second part of the evaluation. When, when it's in the cooked state. So if I'm picking up odors or flavors like buttery or chickeny, I've got a high quality piece of fish there. If I'm tasting some flavors like bitter or smelling something like cheesy, I've got an unacceptable quality fish. Unless you've got like Parmesan crusted something or other, <laughs> some cheese that's supposed to be there, your fish shouldn't uh, smell or taste like cheese. All right. So now it's your turn to try your hand at virtual seafood inspection. So I'm going to put a couple of slides up here and I want you to let me know in the chat box uh, which fish looks like it's better quality. So the first one, which one here, which of these fish is probably better quality, A or B? All right, this is Grace from the chat box. Remember what Whitney just taught us and what are you looking at there? Which one is healthier, A or B? B. And let's see, Texas, Norma, Irene, Michaela, Sean, Elijah, Hannah, Alice and Paul, Jeremy, Christy. Uh, so that's Mrs. He raised class. They're all saying A. We have a few people that are saying B, but most people are saying A. So the A's have it. A is correct. This fish here on the left, um, Fish number A or fish letter A is definitely gonna prob is, is probably gonna be higher quality. And we can tell that because the gills still look really, really fresh. They should be bright red if they're really fresh, and these ones are here. Uh, sample B here is is got it has those brown or tan gills, and uh, they probably don't smell so good. So we actually uh, produced these two pieces of fish during what we call a sensory spoilage run. So we intentionally spoil fish at certain levels so that we can harmonize with our colleagues. And we put out these samples, we all smell them, and then we can really ensure that what I call fishy, you call fishy. What I call cheesy, you call cheesy, right? So we're trying to harmonize with our colleagues so that we all give the same answer every single time during inspections. Uh, but yes, letter A would be probably the higher quality fish here. Uh, and I say probably only because we really don't make determinations based on gills. It's just really to give us an indicator of what kind of quality we're in for when it comes to smelling it or tasting it. All right, next question. Which one of these would be better quality, do you think? All right, this is Grace in the chat box. So there's a big indicator there. Which one looks healthier, A or B? Let's see. We've got Helena. Texas, Theodore, Elijah, Michaela, Brina, Josephine, everybody, Leighton, Janet, everyone is saying B. Awesome job, you guys. Yes, yes, yes. Letter B is exactly correct. This fish here, letter A, has a milkier looking eye uh, or it's becoming opaque in some way. Uh, this fish is definitely probably higher quality than this one here. 
Good job. All right, last question. When we're evaluating raw fish, so remember we're thinking about raw fish, which odor is better? And we're maybe thinking of a specific type of fish here, but that's all right. Uh, watermelon, sour, or cheesy? Which odor is better for quality? All right, this is a very savvy crew. I think I told you that, but they are just showing how savvy they are because overwhelmingly every single person is saying watermelon, A. Good work, you guys. Yes, absolutely. Our raw salmon uh, potentially smells like watermelon. That would be high quality, a high quality indica indicator for that salmon. Good job. So you are all now some honorary seafood inspectors. Uh, come work for us. We're always looking for new folks to smell and taste fish all day long. Um, any questions for me here? You know what? I just because I know that Netsuna is coming up and I want to see his seafood inspection that he's going to do for us. I'm going to hold on to questions and um, let him take us into the inspection facility. Very good. All righty. And, and while, while you're transferring it over to Netsonet, I do want to ask one question because Anthony asked a good one. Why doesn't healthy fish smell fishy? Most fish, uh, when they're super high quality, won't smell like fish. Some fish do. If they have a high oil content, they'll maybe have a fishy odor to them, but they pick up that fishy odor as they start to decompose. So high quality would be uh, things like seaweed, like smelling like the ocean, fresh ocean, seaweedy, briny. And then once it starts to de decompose a little bit, you're going to pick up those fishy odors. So it's still Great. safe to eat, but you, um, you know, you're a little lower in quality there. Great question. Thank you, Whitney. All right, back to you, Netsnet. All right, so I'm going to introduce uh, somebody who you've seen here a number of times throughout the presentation. My colleague Netsonet is going to take us into a real live inspection here in the Long Beach office. So take it away, my friend. Well, thank you very much, Whitney, uh, for that overview information about our program. Uh, and thank you, Brianna, for supplying uh, additional information and Grace for hosting us here today. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Netsonet Anile. Uh, I'm a consumer safety officer here in the seafood inspection program and one of uh, NOAA's seafood uh, sensory experts. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today to talk to you a little bit about uh, one aspect of our seafood inspection program. Um, so before I start, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I graduated uh, from UC Riverside where I studied environmental science with emphasis on natural science. Uh, I always knew that I wanted to do something in public health. Uh, I never thought that I would have become a seafood inspector, but uh, you know, studying the environment, the environment does consist of both land and the ocean. So uh, uh, I, I really enjoyed my, uh, I really enjoyed my career and have learned a lot. Um, so. Why don't I take you where I work so you can see uh, exactly what we do. All right, so this is uh, one of our inspections office located in Long Beach, California. Uh, today, I'm going to show you how to conduct inspection from beginning to the end. Here's our office and our lab where the magic happens. Uh, but before I start any inspection, uh, we, we usually put on the proper gear uh, before handling any product. And the proper gear means putting on a uh, really clean uh, smock, uh, covering our hair with a hair net, putting on a beard guard to cover our beards, and finally putting on some clean gloves. Uh, now, our focus today will be uh, inspecting a product called shrimp. As you can see here, I'm holding two types of shrimp, well, uh, two forms of a shrimp, uh, cooked shrimp and a raw shrimp. The difference between uh, the two, uh, as obvious uh, you can tell, uh, are the colors. The cooked shrimp uh, looks a bit orange to pinkish, while the raw shrimp uh, color looks grayish to whitish. So uh, those are the two differences between a cooked and a raw. Uh, so before I start the inspection, uh, let me give you a brief information about shrimp. Uh, shrimp are a small shellfish of the sea that are related to the crabs and lobsters. Uh, they are invertebrates, which means that they do not have backbones. Uh, they use their many legs called swimmerets, like those, 
to swim and move along the water. Uh, they are scavengers crawling on the ocean floor, eating organic matter they, uh, they find like dead fish, clams, snails, crabs, worms, any other decaying organic matter that they find. Uh, okay, let's get back to our inspection. The first step is to measure the frozen weight of the sample to get what we call the glazed weight. Now, glazing is the process of applying a protective layer of ice on the surface of the product. As you can see here, this product is well glazed uh, and protected, uh, so it's going to stay fresh during storage. Uh, now, you'll find that most of your frozen fishery products in the supermarket uh, have that glaze and thus helps us keep the freshness. The next step is to put all the shrimp into a number five, a number uh, five, eight sieve, uh, where we then gently spray cold water and rinse the, uh, the product until the protective glaze layer is removed. Uh, now, this may take about 20 to 30 seconds to complete. Uh, so after all the glaze is removed, uh, we making sure that the sample is still firm and not completely thawed out. We tilt the sieve at a 17 to 20 degree angle and let the water drain for about two minutes. Uh, now, we do this in order to obtain uh, the net weight of the sample or the weight of the sample without the glaze, uh, as you can see here. Uh, now, this deglazed product, uh, this particular shrimp, as you can see, the glaze has been removed and now we have the true net weight. But the next step is to soften these deglazed shrimp by putting it inside a tub of running cold water. So this uh, cold water is continuous and this usually takes about two to three minutes uh, per sample. Uh, so from time to time, the inspector will check to see how soft the, the shrimp are. Uh, and so uh, as you can see here, uh, after a couple of minutes, the, the shrimp are completely thawed out. Uh, and so uh, the, the glaze is removed and it's ready for further inspection. So now the next step is to look for defects uh, in the thought state. We look for things such as dehydrations, uh, black spots, damaged or broken pieces, and the presence of any uh, inedible material like legs, loose shells, and antennas. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to show you what all these defects look like in, in pictures. Now, this is a shrimp with no defect. Uh, I want to start off with that, showing you a shrimp that has no defect or no flaw. Uh, as you can see, the shrimp here looks translucent and shiny. Uh, uh, the, the meat looks firm and uh, it, it is, it's whitish. So this is a shrimp with no defect. So the first defect or flaw that I, I talked to you about was dehydration. Dehydration is simply uh, drying out. Uh, and this is an example of a severe dehydration, or what we call a clump dehydration. And it's mainly due to improper storage. Uh, so picture you, uh, uh, you know, storing your fresh shrimp without that protective uh, glazed layer inside a freezer. Uh, if you don't have that protective layer, after a few uh, a day or two, uh, your shrimp are going to dry out, and we're going to have what we call a dehydration. Uh, here's more example of uh, dehydration flaw or defect. Uh, on the, my left hand side, we have some raw shrimp uh, that are that show some sign of dehydration, uh, as you can see by that white area on the shell. And on my right hand side, we have a, some cooked shrimp uh, that also show uh, about slight, slight level of uh, dehydration on the, on the meat, on the flesh. Uh, the second defect or flaw that I, I talked about uh, was black spots. Uh, black spots are the presence of any objectionable black or darkened area uh, on the shrimp. And uh, usually for us to consider it, it would have to be larger than a pencil point uh, that penetrates the flesh, uh, such as in this example, uh, in this particular black spot not only is on the flesh, but it has penetrated and it's on the, the, the meat of the, uh, of the shrimp. So we, we consider that a defect. Uh, here are more examples of black spots. 
Now, this particular example shows uh, uh, evidence of black spots that have not penetrated the shell. Uh, it's not on the meat, but it's on the shell. Uh, but we observe it in the, as a combined area of black spots. So by you know, it having this type of uh, present, we um, consider this as a defect or a flaw. Uh, the third thing that I uh, talked about in terms of defect were throat defects. Uh, throat, throats are those portion of the flesh from the head that remain attached to the first part after the head is removed, such as uh, this portion of the flesh of the shrimp. Uh, it's, it's undesirable. We don't want it uh, on, as part of our, our shrimp. Uh, typically, what we want the cut to happen is around the head area, the, uh, next to the, the, the first segment. Uh, so if we find any of these throat uh, meat attached to the shrimp, uh, we score that as a defect uh, or a flaw. Uh, now, the other defect that I talked about were pieces, damaged or broken shrimp. Uh, so if we observe any of these uh, shrimp that are torn, crushed, or mutilated, uh, we, we don't want that, it's undesirable, and we don't consider it as a whole shrimp if it's damaged uh, in, in this manner. So uh, we consider this another defect. Now, the last defect that I uh, uh, talked to you about were uh, unusable material uh, or, or inedible materials like shells and antennas. As you can see here, the shell and the antenna and, uh, and the walking legs attached to the shrimp uh, you know, th this part of the shrimp is not a desirable uh, part of the shrimp. We don't, we don't eat it. And so if we find any evidence of these type of, uh, uh, um, these parts of the shrimp, we collect it and we weigh and measure it and we score it based off of how much it weighs. So this is an uh, unusable and unedible material. So now that we've learned about what each defect is, uh, let's go back to our product inspection. Now, in the raw state, uh, you know, examining the shrimp in the raw state, high quality shrimp will have a smell that can be described as briny or seaweedy or oceany. Uh, some of these terms earlier, uh, Whitney had mentioned. Uh, so that is a high quality shrimp. Now, an average or acceptable shrimp will have a smell described as stale or cardboardy. That means that the shrimp is still good, but it's not super fresh. And an unacceptable shrimp, which means a rejected shrimp, would have a smell of sour or cheesy or yeasty. So if a shrimp smells like that, uh, please do not eat it. Uh, and so it's important to know what a good fish or high quality fish smells like uh, in order to consume it. Now, to make our final determination of what type of quality of the shrimp, we need to cook the sample and evaluate it for flavor and odor again. Uh, sometimes uh, some of the odors that we observe in the raw state might or might not be there when we cook it. Uh, you see me here cooking the, the product for about two minutes. Uh, and so um, in order to make my final decision, I have to determine what kind of odor I'm getting. Uh, so this particular sample that I'm uh, looking at uh, contains some high quality smell descriptors like, so a good high quality shrimp will smell like cooked corn like or cooked rice like. So that is the, the odor that we want. Uh, so the next thing, next thing I'm gonna do is for evaluating for flavor, uh, that means I have to taste it. And so we want a high quality shrimp, we want it to taste uh, sweet and, and salty. Uh, if it tastes bitter and sour, that means it's, a, it's not a good shrimp. Uh, so by looking at, uh, you know, for key indicators such as appearance and odor, uh, flavor, and uh, actually texture as well, and, uh, that I didn't really get into detail of, by looking at those specific uh, uh, indicators, we can tell the difference between a good or high quality shrimp and uh, a low or a bad shrimp. So, uh, it's important to use our senses to, to uh, kind of help us decide the quality of shrimp. Uh, and so if, if, they, if all the shrimps and samples that we looked at pass all that parameters, uh, we go ahead and uh, certify this product and is good for 
trade and uh, uh, to be in your local grocery. Uh, that is it for my presentation. I hope you all enjoyed uh, what I had presented and learned something new. Um, any questions? Great. Well, this is Grace in the chat box. We're almost out of time, so I'm going to ask you a few quick questions, Netsonet, and sure. um, just tell you that now you've made me really hungry. So uh, I guess that's a sign that it's good seafood as well. It looks good. So one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, and this comes from Carrie, have you ever gotten um, food poisoning when you've been inspecting and testing the seafood? Um, personally, no. Uh, so you know, coming into this job, uh, you're you're trained before you look at any product. Uh, you're trained well before you taste or smell any product. So uh, you know, you know, before doing your inspections, uh, those particular uh, type of skills before you consume it. So um, I know typically any, like I said, uh, a bad shrimp or low quality, uh, uh, low quality shrimp will have a, t a typical descriptors. So if I smell that, I don't, you know, uh, you know I take, take a lot of caution. So, um, so, so far, no, I have not gotten sick yet. Good. Well, we're glad to hear that. Um, and then this question comes from Anthony. Are the black spots that you showed us um, bad for the live shrimp? Uh, so is it bad for the live shrimp? Is that what you asked? That was the question, yes. Oh, right. So so these black spots, uh, you know, they, they do, uh, we do observe some black spots uh, on, on the live product as well, uh, but mostly uh, Something that I didn't get into uh, called white spots are also on, observed on live shrimp, uh, but we don't get to score uh, the quality of the shrimp when they're live. We look at them, you know, once they're ready for, uh, after processing and ready for uh, distribution. Gotcha. And um, one of the questions that came in and this gets back to what you inspect, is do you only inspect shrimp or do you inspect salmon or tuna? So does each inspector inspect more than one type of um, fish? Uh, no, so we, we train our inspectors to inspect uh, any and everything uh, related to seafood and fishery product. So even uh, some product that's characterized as a fishery product, meaning it has some fish and some other ingredient like dough, uh, they're trained to inspect that. So there's not one specific, uh, you know, product category that we are trained to inspect. It's any and everything that comes from the, the ocean. Gotcha. That probably keeps it interesting as well. You get to inspect yeah. lots of different yeah. things. All right. I, um, there are still, okay, last question, because we're running out of time. I did, there's so many questions and it's so interesting. Um, do you ever get tired of tasting the seafood? Uh, no, no. Uh, like you said, there's a variety of seafood out there, uh, so uh, it's always changing. What I'm looking at, it's it's, it's different. Uh, and uh, who? No, uh, seafood tastes delicious. I never have gotten. Great, and I'll share that I asked the same question during the practice, I think. So thank you so much, Netsonet, and I'm going to um, invite the others to come back on just while we say goodbye. So I just want to say. Um, Thank you so much for agreeing to share this with us. I know that I learned a lot during this presentation and I hope that all of our viewers did as well. There's just a lot I don't know about seafood inspection. So thanks so much for sharing your expertise and taking us through your um, facilities. We really, really enjoyed it. And I know that when I go to the grocery store, I'm going to look with a new set of eyes this time. So thanks so much for that. For those of us that, uh, for those of you that want to tune in next week, on Tuesday in our Alaska Sister Series, we're going to be going behind the scenes. Our open house will be at the Kodiak Lab in Alaska, so that's going to be really, really cool. And then on Wednesday, we're going to the Aircraft Operations Center, and that in Florida is going to be really neat. We'll be touring some of the NOAA planes, and we'll be seeing the fabrication shop. So next week is going to be a banner week, whether you join us Tuesday or Wednesday or both. Looking forward to seeing both of those presentations. So thanks so much for joining us today, and we will see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.